old Belarusian civilization had been prosperous for five centuries. The ancient Belarusians had rich musical culture. This instrument has added its vivid page to Belarusian traditional culture to such a degree that Belarus is equal in this respect to Scotland. The Belarusian bagpipe is a wind reed musical instrument first mentioned in old Belarusian literature back in the 15th century. Researching the history of the bagpipe in Belarus, that is mythology of this instrument and its place in the ritual and sacral practice, I've come to the conclusion that this instrument had never arrived here from anywhere. The bagpipe had been taking shape on this land from the earliest times. According to the Belarusian ethnic tradition, the bagpipe is born during a ritual at Christmas. There's an old Belarusian carol with the following lyrics. Dear she goat, fear not the warrior fellows. Be afraid of the old man though, as he will kill thee. Flay thy skin and make a bagpipe. At Yuletide there were theatricals, when people disguised in Christmas apparel and masks used to walk from home to home and congratulate the owners. During these celebrations the Yule singers would allegedly kill a goat. A person dressed as a goat would ostensibly die and only come alive again when the owners presented the carolers with gifts. There is every reason to believe that in olden days, long before Christianity, the 25th of December was marked by a sacrifice of a goat, and an instrument was then made of its skin. The bagpipe is a symbol of harmony of the world and pacification of gods. I'm thrilled with the understanding that this instrument has 6,000 years of culture. The great cultural revolution which happened due to domestication of animals is personified in this instrument. And this startles me. Apparently, there were families who preserved the traditions of this instrument. The pipes' funnels were usually kept in a bagpiper's family and inherited by a son. When a bagpipe's life was over, the son had to make a bagpipe himself, using his father's funnels. That was such a family tradition. It's also possible to say that a bagpipe was only played for one year and every time at Christmas a new instrument was made. Then the bagpipe was hung on an oak tree or shattered against it. Thus, the bagpipe was used for a year and then a new instrument was made. In distinction from the Scottish or Galician ones, the genius of the Belarusian bagpipe is that it used to be more connected with cultic practice. The bagpipe was a very important fact in the pre-Christian outlook on the organization of the world. The bagpiper and his bagpipe were thought to be a juncture of various elements. The bagpiper would epitomize Piarun, the god of thunder and lightning, 
The bagpipe used to be an embodiment of VLS, the god of animals and an antagonist of Piarun. Altogether, the bagpiper and his bagpipe would react upon each other and create a sacred alliance. During a Belarusian engagement ceremony, a bridegroom and his bagpiper would come to meet a bride and her bagpiper. The betrothed pair could not talk during the ceremony. Instead of them, their bagpipers would do it by playing their complimentary tunes. The first image of the bagpipe from Belarus was made by the Swedish traveler Olaus Magnus in his book called The History of the Northern Nations. That was in 1555. However, a bagpipe of a German design is what we see in his engraving. Is it possible that the Swede Magnus was mistaken when attributing such an instrument to the Belarusian lands? The thing is that in the 16th century the bagpipes of German design spread all over Northern Europe. If we take a look at the miniatures and engravings of the 16th century, we shall see that such bagpipes were popular in many European countries. As it happens, there was a nobleman from the city of Vilnia whose name was Maciej Herdroitz who helped Magnus in preparing his book. Furthermore, a historian from Stockholm, Andrei Kutlerchuk, thinks that Heerdroitz did picture a bagpiper from his homeland. Magnus wrote under his engraving, The bagpiper's music is so alluring that bears get out of the woods. We carried out an experiment. We made a bagpipe of the same design, dressed a bagpiper in that period's style, and brought a live bear. Amazingly, the bear stuck it out and even enjoyed the sounds of the bagpipe. The oldest Belarusian bagpipe is now kept in the regional museum of the town of Lepiel. If we are talking about the uniqueness of this instrument, then it is in its aesthetics. The bagpipe has the most beautiful patterns and lines. It's distinguished by its garniture and tin marquetry. Let's listen to the sound of the bagpipe playing in the so-called closed manner. It's likely that this instrument was played to accompany somebody's singing because this bagpipe's sound is associated with the Calendarian and other festive folklore songs from this region of Belarus. That was an instrument without which the musician himself could not live spiritually.
The second Baltic Bagpipe Festival has taken place in Minsk. Musicians from Lithuania, Sweden, Scotland and Belarus have demonstrated their masterhood in playing the ancient instrument bagpipe. During one of the expeditions to northern Belarus, an old woman told us a story about a bagpiper who had fitted a skull of a goat with horns to his bagpipe. A melody pipe poked out of the skull. This instrument looked quite peculiar. A bagpiper used to inflate the bag, then press it and finger the melody pipe. That usually resulted in very lovely music while the bagpiper sang to it. The old man played handsomely. It was before World War II. His bagpipe looked like this one. The only difference, it seems to me, is that there was no such funnel on the end. Does uh, the sound of this bagpipe resemble that of the old one? Well, pipe it up. It does resemble, and the drone did sound the same. That old bagpipe did have a similar voice too. It was back in the 1930s. That bagpiper's instrument looked like yours. He had a wooden melody pipe. Under his elbow there was the bag, and he used to press it and play it very beautifully. However, this big drone wasn't here, unlike yours, but here, on the front. His bag was like a pear, just like it's pictured here. His bagpipe was exactly like this one presented here. He used to have the drone pipe this way, on his knees, and the bag in another way, like this. Our bagpipe music is not weaker than that in Ireland and Scotland. We even have more interesting tunes, and the repertoire is much larger. The dulcimer can relax you by enshrouding you in a fog. I could call it a female musical instrument. The bagpipe is a male musical instrument. It provokes your volitions. In modern times, it's getting more and more interesting because the bagpipe now is part of bands playing extremely various music, including medieval and post-folklore. The Belarusian bagpipe can even be heard in rock groups.
This instrument could be heard in knights' castles, on cities' main squares, and even in churches. It became a symbol of musical and poetic art of all Europe. The sound of the lute differs from all the other instrument sounds, taking into account that the sound is very quiet and the lute itself has no big dynamic and timber possibilities, its sound is extremely soft and pleasant. It mesmerizes the listener. It's very exciting to listen to what contemporary lutenists say about the lute. It was my good fortune to communicate with some of them. For instance, Brian Wright once said philosophically that the sounds of the guitar are directed outside, to the hall. Their target is the listener, while the sounds of the lute go straight inside the person who plays it. The lute is a stringed, plucked musical instrument, first mentioned on the Belarusian territory in the late 15th and early 16th century. It's very important that it was in the lute repertoire, both for organ and clavier, that we can see a similarity between Western European music and Belarusian music. Nowadays, the names of medieval Belarusian lutenists are being revived. Thus, for example, now we know about a certain Churila who played the lute and sang in the old Belarusian language to the Grand Duke Sigismundus. It was in the early 16th century. The lute accompanied people both in their campaigns and combat sections. It could be found both in artisans' houses and gentlefolks' palaces. I can't help thinking of such a comparison. Just like today, it's difficult to find a family who has no guitar. In olden days, it was possible to find a lute in any home. The professional use of the lute in Belarus began in the 16th century. Many historians think that this happened thanks to Bona Sforza, the wife of the Grand Duke Sigismundus. She was a patron of the arts and invited a lot of musicians from Europe in the early 16th century. Bona Sforza was a good lutenist herself. She was fond of traveling and preferred to be accompanied by the lute sounds during her journeys. The first instruments of this kind, or more exactly, their cases, were made of the shell of a tortoise or a pumpkin, which then were covered with leather. Later, the masters started to produce the lute's cases from wood. The quantity of the lute's edges varies from 11 or more. The second part of the lute is its fingerboard. The work on the case is completed by gluing the most important detail, the neck. It's the main detail, because the quality of the sound of the eventual instrument depends on the quality of wood and the manufacturing process. Unlike a later instrument, the guitar, the lute has a sound sound hole, also called a rose, which is in the form of a different coiling branches or other complex patterns. The presence of such a rose confirms an oriental origin of the lute. 
In the days of the Renaissance and Baroque periods, the lute played a key role for amateurs playing music. There is certain evidence of this. For instance, in his memoirs of the late 17th century, the Mianzk city governor Krzysztof Zawisza writes about a party thrown once in his house, where a daughter of a judge was playing the lute very well. Among his servants, Zawisza mentions a certain musician Belinsky, who was a lutenist and a violinist and an exceptionally good person. The lute was considered to have a psychotherapeutic quality as well. It was believed that a person with a toothache could send for a lutenist whose music would help to ease the pain. If somebody suffered from insomnia, the lute was thought to settle this matter too. The lute music used to accompany meals, meetings and dance parties. The lute became the favorite musical instrument of the Belarusian aristocracy and urbanites. The first picture of an instrument that looks like the lute can be found in the Book of Psalms, printed in Belarus in the first half of the 16th century. The Renaissance lute is pictured on the front page of a songbook published in 1588. A poet accompanied by the lute is declaiming his poems, an engraving of 1618, music played by a baroque lute, an engraving of 1644. A nobleman is studying how to play the lute, a drawing of 1646. A burger with a lute, an engraving by Alexander Tarasievich, a lot of melodies were written for the lute. The thing is that the musicians of that time, unlike their contemporary counterparts, had to be gifted not only as composers, but performers as well. And that was an essential condition. It was as easy for a guitarist to switch to the lute as it was for a lutenist to start playing the guitar. However, being a lutenist was considered more prestigious. Among famous Western European lutenists who lived and worked in Belarus, there's the Venetian lutenist Diomedes Cato, who was master of the music in the city of Grodna in the 1660s. Western European poetry of the 17th century praised the musical art of the French lutenist Antoine Gallo de Angero, who spent his last years of life in Belarus. In the middle of the 18th century, the renowned Czech lutenist Joseph Kogut worked in the Duke's Kapellen of the Radzivils in the towns of Slutsak and Niaswij. St. Petersburg, Moscow, Vilna, Frankfurt am Main, Brussels, as well as Warsaw, Krakow, and other cities of other Slavic countries, in all of them, in their museums and archives, there are music catalogs directly attached to the history of Belarusian musical art.
The lute is a polyphonic musical instrument which was generally used to accompany singing. Every time a monarch had visitors, his lutenist had to write a completely new piece of music for every occasion. For example, if one and the same person came yesterday and is coming today, yesterday's music could not be used anymore. The lute happens to have very strong roots in Belarus. This could hardly have occurred in the neighboring countries, I mean in Russia or Ukraine. In the days of the Renaissance and Baroque periods, a lot of talented lutenists lived in Belarus. I can't help recalling the story of how, at the beginning of the USSR's existence, every Soviet Republic was ordered to choose its one basic national musical instrument. In Bielo, Russia, the Soviets decided that the dulcimer must be that artificially created national instrument, even though the dulcimer mostly belongs to the musical traditions of Moldova and Ukraine. Thus, the real national musical instrument of Belarus was not found. With such a rich history connected with our country, the lute has played its pivotal role in the history of Belarusian musical art, so that it can be called not only an all-European instrument, but the Belarusian national musical instrument as well. The hurdy-gurdy is a stringed, bowed musical instrument with a wheel as a bow. The hurdy-gurdy is first mentioned in old Belarusian literature back in the early 17th century. The Belarusian hurdy-gurdy has a long evolution. The Belarusian hurdy-gurdy of a Gothic design. The hurdy-gurdy of a Renaissance design. The Belarusian Baroque hurdy-gurdy the guitar-like hurdy-gurdy, the hurdy-gurdy from the town of Slutsak. In Western Europe, the hurdy-gurdy tradition is still alive. However, it's mostly dance music that is still played with the help of this instrument there. The particularity of Belarus was that our hurdy-gurdy players were esteemed men who originally belonged to that segment of the pre-Christian priesthood whose role was to travel. The hurdy-gurdy players were itinerant. They used to cover much ground and visit sacred places. Там го завше до падне, ледве так лотне го. Стоит он на облаках, пенди коня своего. Устен пует и немче, и можен и турчене. Пуки се вас погоней, туры не на вине.
In the past, the hurdy-gurdy players were thought to be spiritual messengers of God. Regardless of their age, they could be young or old, the hurdy-gurdy players weren't perceived as human beings, but kinda ghosts by inhabitants of regular Belarusian villages. There was a certain ritual. The mission of a hurdy-gurdy player was to visit all the houses in a village and to pray for the deceased in a family. Still, the hurdy-gurdy players weren't beggars. It was a lifestyle with their own view of the world. It was quite an interesting tradition, because an old man visiting a village was a guest from a better world, and his singing would unite this world and the next one. On the one hand, the hurdy-gurdy was used for sacred singing to honor the Christian saints. On the other hand, this instrument had fallen into its place in the traditional life of common people. A third line of development of the Hurdegurdi tradition is court and secular culture. The oldest Belarusian hurdy-gurdy is now kept in the regional museum of Minsk region. This instrument dates back to the late 19th century. In terms of the tuning pins, there were four strings. One was here, another one right here, as there are two string holders, and the other two strings would go to the keyboard box. The interesting fact is that the strings, which would go from the keys to the wheel, were separated by a barrier. Religious and historical songs used to be accompanied by the hurdy-gurdy. However, during parties it was used to play dance tunes as well. In order to perform a dance melody with the help of the hurdy-gurdy, it was necessary to move the wheel in jerks, thus producing a sound every time a key was pressed. We should also mention the school of Master Krako, who developed his own version of the hurdy-gurdy, whose keys were in the form of round buttons, just like those of the accordion, and were placed on the upper part of the keyboard. Any wood can come alive thanks to the hands of Uladzimir Krako, who turns it into dulcimers, pipes and hurdy that will be played all over the country. This master used to make modern versions of hurdy according to his own view. They differ a little bit from the authentic instruments. Most of his hurdy are used by folklore bands. Sometimes it was just an exotic thing on stage. Master Krako's ideas were continued by his student, Uladzimir Puzinio. I'm fascinated with folklore music and an ancient singing. I'm grateful to my teachers as they sparked a fire in my soul. I began to feel the honor of being a Belarusian. They inspired me for the rest of my life with a desire to work in this field. 
The first among our well-known musicians who became interested in this instrument and who introduced it to a wide audience was the Pesniari band. They had a hurdy-gurdy of a baroque design. I don't know who made their instrument. Well, if you watch their first performances, you can see that their hurdy-gurdy was used actively. Unlike other masters, I was more interested in the old tradition and tried to make an instrument based on authentic patterns, bearing in mind the specific image of a hurdy-gurdy player. My research has resulted in an instrument like this. The hurdy-gurdy you can see behind me was made in accordance with the design of the Belarusian hurdy-gurdy from the town of Slutsak. I only refined some acoustical elements. The main elements of the hurdy-gurdy are a keyboard, a tuning pins box, an upper sound box, sidewalls, a lower sound box, a wheel cover, a friction wheel, and a handle. This instrument attracts the attention of everybody who's not indifferent to our history and the way our ancestors used to live. The psaltery is a stringed, plucked musical instrument first mentioned in the literary works of the 12th century. The acoustic principle of the psaltery is rather interesting, obtained as a result of vibration of a string. The sound is reaching the sound box through the air, and in some measure through the string holder and the tuning pins box and is enforced then due to the interplay of the sound box and the case itself. The sound, its timbre and coloration are created with the help of the so-called resonating body, which is a semicircular projection of the resonating sound box. In the ancient world, there was a status division of the musical instruments. The wind instruments were used during ecstatic rituals honoring the god Dionysus, and their task was to reach an altered state of consciousness. The stringed instruments, in their turn, were connected with the god Apollo. It was an aristocratic tradition. Music of the stringed instruments would provide a person with calm, balanced and noble feelings. A reflection of a similar division can be found in Belarusian folklore songs, like in this Belarusian wedding song. When the bagpipe started howling, everybody went berserk. But when the psaltery began, everyone was sane again. 
There are three fundamental types of psalteries. The first group is the so-called lyre-shaped psalteries, also known as psalteries with a playing window. The second group is the so-called helmet-shaped psalteries. And the third group is the so-called wing-shaped psalteries. The official chronology of psalteries begins in the 11th century. Among these three types, the oldest one is the lyre-shaped psaltery. The main feature of the lyre-shaped psalteries is that they have a window in their case, while the other types of psalteries don't. Also, psalteries with a playing window must be held upright, just like a lyre or a harp, unlike the other kinds. The tradition of the lyre-shaped psalteries had been developing in Eastern Europe under the Scandinavian influence. But in the 13th century, psalteries with a playing window relinquished their place to psalteries of another design from the Christian Byzantine Empire, whose design was more helmet-shaped. The work on this very instrument isn't completed yet. It's gonna be a helmet-shaped psaltery with ten strings. When the lyre-shaped psalteries disappeared in Eastern Europe, their place was occupied not only by the helmet-shaped psalteries, but the wing-shaped ones as well. Valkavisk, the 12th century. Warsh Gospel, the 14th century. Radzivil Chronicle, the 15th century. Vilnia Art School, the 16th century. Vitebsk Gubernia, 1902. Psaltery from ethnographer Privalo's book, 1927. Psaltery player from ethnographer Privalo's book. One of my favorite variants of this instrument is the wing-shaped psaltery, which existed in Latvia and northern Belarus. Young men used to make this musical instrument so that they could play it handsomely, thus attracting young ladies. This tradition is described in wedding songs, legends, fairy tales, and even in historical documents of the 12th century. I was fortunate to get acquainted with my then future wife when I was playing this altar too. In the late 1980s, I was filming a wedding ritual in the village of Motal, which is in South Belarus. There was such a moment during the wedding, when a sister of the fiancé was strewing some rye on the newlyweds, while other women were singing a song which had the following lyrics. I'm standing over the river, 
and I'm playing the Kistanke. I asked some women from that village what the word Kistanke meant. They told me that this musical instrument was a usual thing for them, and that any old man in their village could make it. Usually, it was made of an elk's shoulder stringed with sinews. The lad who played that instrument was born in 1916. He kept playing it till the Second World War. After that, it was my dad who played it. I bet you seem to be playing just like my father. The psaltery is a fundamentally simple instrument. It's nothing but a trough hollowed out of a whole tree trunk or a board, plus a fir tree plate and some strings. When I start making a psaltery, I just take a piece of well-dried wood, whose form is close to that of the psaltery. And when I feel that this piece already sounds in my hands, that there is some acoustics in this wood, then I try to give it this or that form and to draw a renaissance, so to say, from this piece of wood. First I line it out, picturing the form of the future instrument. Then, with the help of a chisel, I carve out a sound box. A chisel or an axe is used during it. When an instrument has its preliminary form, I attach a sounding plate in our studio. We try different kinds of glue, preferring those which correspond to the old technologies, such as fish glue and various types of joiner's glue. When the sockets are done and the sounding plate is attached, the whole instrument must be polished and oiled. This very case is reproved with wax and gallipot. That will prevent the instrument from changing its acoustics in any atmospheric conditions. However, a psaltery can't start sounding right away. I ain't sure about other masters, but I can't understand the sound of an instrument at the beginning. Maybe it's because I'm used to these sounds. Or maybe a psaltery has to be filled with positive vibrations first. Only after have I played it a week or two am I able to say whether its sound is good or bad. The psaltery is a very delicate instrument with no heavy acoustics, unlike the contemporary, well-developed orchestral instruments. Let's compare it with the classical guitar, for instance. If we play the guitar and the psaltery at the same time, the guitar will kill and strangle the psaltery with its timbre, and vice versa. The psaltery sounds very well with the instruments of a similar origin and same acoustics acoustic characteristics. Belarusian trumpet is a wind mouthpiece musical instrument, first pictures of which can be found in Belarusian documents of the 13th century. Alongside with straight trumpets, there were curved ones too. Sometimes they were covered with birch bark. If we take a look at the Radzivill Chronicle of the 15th century, we shall find the Belarusian trumpet pictured as the main martial alerting instrument. Based on the miniatures of this chronicle, we can say that our trumpet was mostly used during warfare everyday life of the medieval knights in the times of war can't be imagined without this instrument. Bye. 
two types of the Belarusian trumpet, straight and curved ones, can be seen in the Radzivil Chronicle. This Belarusian trumpet is characterized by a bigger curve and thinner sides. The trumpets have been made in Belarus since the olden days. Laurisha Gospel, the 13th century. Radzivil Chronicle, the 15th century. Vilnia Art School, the 16th century. Plays with bears in the Grand Duchy, 1555. Martin Bielski Chronicle, 1595. Battle of Kurgaum, engraving of the 17th century, engraving to honor the Tishkeviches. I always recall the first trumpet I made, as it was a very interesting instrument. That was the time when such trumpets were included into musical scores of opera and symphony orchestras. It happened after a young composer whose name was Uladzimir Sultan visited my studio one day. He was writing an opera based on one of the historical novels by our great author Karat Kievich. I suggested that the Belarusian trumpet should be used used in it when the opera was premiered the audience as well as the conductor the orchestra and the soloists accepted this instrument very well as a master i was very glad that our traditional instrument found its place in the belarusian opera this is spruce, a regular fir tree. It's quite natural that it has such a smooth curve. The first step is to strip the tree of its bark. The next step is to side and long in two. After that, it's necessary to carve out the inner contents of these two parts. That must be done very fast, because the wood is raw and may warp. Then we treat them with glue, fold them and fix them. The trumpet was widespread among common people in South Belarus, mostly in the region of Palesia. The Belarusian peasants used to make very long trumpets, whose length could be one and a half or even two meters. It was pictured in 1927 by our ethnographer Privalo. When the trumpet is glued and its parts are fixed, we come to the last step in the work on it. It's extremely important to color it a bit by natural dyes, then to saturate it with wax, linseed, oil and gallipot. The work is completed when a wooden embouchure is attached. Five early musical instruments, five characters, five stories. And this is just a small piece of our rich musical heritage. <laughs> 